Good morning. You're all very welcome. This is the last in our seminar series, Visioning the Future, Artistic Doctorates in Ireland. I'm Jules Gilson. I'm Professor of Creative Practice at UCC and I'm also Head of the School of Film, Music and Theatre. So it's a bittersweet morning because um, it's been an extraordinary three months um, for us and um, this seminar really kind of brings together um, all of the uh, things that we've been doing over the past three months and 15 seminars. So what I'd like to do um, is uh, I'm just going to read a short text first and then I'm going to introduce who uh, people are on the panel today. I'm doing this because um, I wanted to just bring together um, some thoughts that I'm having around both this seminar series and the particular moment that we're all grappling with at the, at the moment. Here we go. It rains. On the window in front of me here are the ground oats and seeds I placed in the bird feeder yesterday. It takes the birds a while to notice that I've filled the feeder, but late yesterday afternoon, a solitary blue tit arrives to taste my offerings. This morning, standing on the low windowsill of the living room, looking out over Cork City, there is a ribbon of mist across the river. Looking closer, I notice brightly coloured bunting all over my neighbour's house across the road. I text her in wonderment, and she tells me it's her daughter's 21st, and that, and that since the celebration will be small, an uncle came in the night and made a party of the front of their house. We came to plan this seminar series in the spring of 2020, when it was clear we couldn't do the things we put in our proposal, a conference, a workshop. We hastily took heed of how the few other people we knew had done such things had gone about it. We planned our 15 seminars once or twice a week over three months. And what we have discovered as we stumbled into this new form is that this has been a gift. An hour of shot felt impossibly short when we began, but actually this has been a blessing. It was a bite-sized commitment for so many of us with busy lives. For me, it became an anchor in the week when all manner of COVID chaos was coming at us. It made it possible to think about broader and wider things than the pandemic, even as we wove its movements into our discussions. It also made it possible for us to have exceptional speakers from across Europe and within Ireland who generously agreed to participate, often at short notice. In late August, my father had a stroke and I traveled to the UK to support my mum and stayed for almost a month. I chaired four of these seminars from my childhood bedroom and without this online format for these seminars, I would not have had the gift of time to be with my parents and they are doing well. Yesterday, we learned that there were 60 new cases of COVID-19 in Cork. There is an air of anticipation that we will move to level three and many of us are grappling with the first week of teaching online. But here in the garden on Summerhill North, the blue tit comes to feed at my window again and I ready myself for the last in this seminar series. I am grateful for small and ordinary things, for slowness and not trying too hard. And so I thank you for being here today and for being here on other days and for remembering the importance of artistic sensibilities and academia and how often artists and all of us will find a way. So um, welcome again. And this morning um, I've got four colleagues um, with us, uh, Yvonne Bonenfant, who's head of theatre at UCC, Kira Chambers, who's head of film and screen media, um, uh, Helen Phelan from um, the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance, and uh, Triana Nikhil Horn, who's head of music at UCC. And they're all here today to reflect on this seminar series. So before I turn to them, um, I wanted, uh, and Inesh first, I wanted um, just to reflect on where we are in terms of the seminar series and in terms of the research project more broadly. So we've shifted from um, this, these seminar series to um, another part, the last part of the research project and we'll be developing online resources which we'll be looking at drafts of today um, and so Ines she's focusing very much on that and she's also doing um, interviews which will feed into those processes so we very much want your input on those things and we'll take the seminar series as well as the interviews as raw material for what we're doing 
So um, without further ado, I'm going to pa pass over to my wonderful colleague, Ines Bento Coelho, who's the postdoctoral scholar um, and the real a great driving force within this research pro project, Ines. Thank you so much, Jules. Um, it's really wonderful to hear your thoughts just now this morning. Uh, for me, doing this research project from another country, um, living somewhere else, only being for Ireland once, and then uh, having the challenges of COVID and how you work on a project with people that are in different places has been a learning curve as well. So it has also been wonderful to have many guests and I'm also thankful for all the participants and the questions that generated so many discussions. Um, so there's just a couple of things that I would like to share that have struck with me. Um, the first one is this idea of the impossibility to offer solutions. Michaela Glantz talked about this in the supervision session um, in thinking of what works for one particular context or PhD may not work for another and in being very mindful that each PhD project is very individual with specific sets of characteristics and that we need to think about how we can provide tools or suggestions or even sets of questions for students and supervisors to be able to make decisions on what might work best for that their specific project from an important point, from an important point of view. So recognizing that instead of solutions, what we can offer are potential frameworks for practice. And within those frameworks, there has to be some flexibility, but also some clear guidance. So that's one of the points I take forward as we develop the open educational resources. The second point is um, recognizing the diversity of approaches. And Vida Michelo gave an example when she talked about when she came across examining a PhD, which follows a very distinct approach. And she spoke about how it is important to recognize that other institutions may have distinct requirements, structures, approaches, and they are as valid as the ones we usually work on. And that might be in regards to regulations or PhD structure or even supervision, for example. And interestingly, in supervision, we've been offered a wide range of views from Michaela Glan, Vida Michelo, and Andrea Braid. And they're all very different, but they all complement one another in offering distinct approaches. So that goes back to the first point of um, being mindful of not offering one solution, but uh, having a map of possibilities. And then thirdly, recognizing that we're working within an academic context. And that came up in a discussion with Andrea Brett, thinking about how artistic research might produce distinct results or outcomes than, for example, chemistry or biology or another scientific field. However, we are still located within an institutional framework, the academic, academic framework that comes with its own idiosyncrasies, its own politics, and that we need to navigate to successful, uh, complete the um, PhD or the supervision of PhD students. So those are the three things that I'm thinking that are important to take on board as we develop the open educational resources, the impossibility to offer solutions and think more in terms of proposals and suggestions, recognizing the diversity of approaches, but also recognizing our context as um, the academic context. So at this moment, I'm going to pass on to Dr. Yvonne Bonanfan, who is the head of department of theater at UCC. Yvonne. Hi. So um, uh, as Ines just did, we were asked to all just think through what we take away from the series so far and what we might um, hope for to come of um, this moment in the future. And um, I think Inesh spoke very beautifully about also what I take away from the series so far. And I think I'm gonna speak in broad themes with one little um, specific reference. And I think the broad themes that come out are that artistic research is about navigating mess and it's about um, navigating fields that a lot of other academic fields would have traditionally called woolly. And that wooliness is what we and what doctoral students are actually um, weaving textile from. And that, um, and braiding and knitting and um, felting. 
And so I think the, the very different approaches and the knowledge that we gleaned about where different territories and different people and different disciplines are with that process of um, textile construction uh, was super, super valuable. From my own uh, disciplinary perspective, if I have one, I was particularly fond of um, Annette Arlender's uh, um, uh, really incisive reading of tensions particular to the theatrical and live slash performance art domain, ten the tension between um, show business and experimentality, um, which then straddles that tension, the tension of um, the polarities that can be seen to exist between research and art making. Either they're polarities or they completely aren't, depending on your perspective. Um, and also uh, the way that um, we, uh, this field is really good at uh, straddling, jumping between and making meaning from seeming opposites and can yoke together opposites in really productive ways. Because I guess those are sort of meta observations. It's also been very valuable for me as somebody that's only lived in Ireland for two years to understand better um, what's happening in Ireland and the actual ecology of uh, practice, inclusive research and artistic research in the arts in Ireland. Um, what I would like to see coming from this series, I guess, I'm going to talk again in kind of meta projects that are all too big to come out of this, but perhaps the beginnings of them uh, or some of them might be spurred. Um, one of them is advocacy. I wonder if there is room for a national doctoral school rather than institution-based doctoral schools exclusively. I wonder if there is um, a way that those of us who are employed in academia could be advocating because of our salaries on behalf of the field in new ways inside Ireland, particularly because this crisis has thrown up real challenges to every economy and culture um, that I think artistic thinking can help navigate right now. Um, and I'm wondering if there might not just be a, a Irish approach to methodological seminars. Some students love formulas and they love to work inside formulas and some students come into the doctorate precisely to reject every formula. But um, for the ones that um, um, want formulas, it can be really useful to share approaches to uh, unique ways of those formulas being. The second, um, uh, the second kind of impetus I imagine coming from this is some way of bringing together and maybe Embus uh, takes a, a, a really strong role in this, um, uh, ways of providing PhD students with new kinds of opportunities opportunities for mobility between institutions inside the Irish context, and also opportunities for mobility across, at least at this point, the European space where so many of the job and career development opportunities will be for um, doctoral students, just because in any single territory, the range of job opportunities and work opportunities is often small. And one of the ways of cobbling together career is really to work across spaces and bring opportunities from different places together. I wonder if there's uh, also an approach that we and the PhD system should be taking. So we as supervising academics perhaps and the PhD system itself could be taking to articulate the value of artistic thinking to wider culture as a response to crisis. And, um, uh, and, that, and if that could come out of some of the approaches to doctoral study, that would be amazing. And finally, um, for me as a newcomer to Ireland, uh, I experience Ireland so far, and I hope this isn't purely with some kind of touristic eye and touristic ear. I hope that, but because I've only been here for two years, maybe it is, and I apologize if it is. But for me, um, this is a very vocalic culture, and it's a culture that welcomes the multiplicity of viewpoints and individualities that come from respecting that the invocalized body has unique things to say. And I think um, it could be very exciting to uh, articulate um, 
an Irish approach to this thing called the Viva Voce. Actually, some of the people talking about Viva Voce were wondering whether the whole Viva Voce, the vocal defense is actually, uh, of a PhD is actually superfluous and maybe um, a remnant of a, of, a, of a way of working that's super patriarchal. And I wonder if that could be turned on its head and if we could think of PhDs where the only defense was vocal, actually, and where the primary articulation of the research content is through the live body um, rather than through the fossilized document. Um, although, of course, the fossilized document has its place in reifying the live body and then imprisoning it in stone. So um, I think that's what I, what I hope for. And those are kind of meta things and not very practical in my case. But I think there could be practical steps inside whatever happens next. Thanks. I now introduce my colleague, Dr. Kira Chambers, head of the Department of Film and Screen Media at UCC for her reflections. Thanks, Yvonne. Well, it's been really useful for the perspective of film and screen media to be involved in this seminar series because film uh, as a subject area is relatively new to creative practice. While it's becoming much more widespread now, the procedures and the culture associated with creative screen practice are evolving. So I find the seminar series really useful in terms of learning from colleagues in music and theatre with longer traditions of creative practice. And for me, what was very interesting to see were the case studies, particularly in, in recent weeks, the case studies related to PhD research have been fascinating to see the interdisciplinarity of approaches, the various methodologies that are emerging. And it was also interesting to see that film has a place in music and theatre in terms of interactions with the visual form. So that gave rise to, to really interesting thoughts on interdisciplinarity, on interinstitutional approaches that we might take, um, and how we can kind of view this as a, as a broader challenge in terms of bringing together some of the different subject areas. Also useful were the explorations of practicalities. So for example, in relation to the supervision process, in relation to the vibe of processes, whether or not they will continue to exist in their traditional form, but hearing about how those processes are undertaken in other countries and other institutions was incredibly useful. And also this opens up to us a network of researchers and experts that we can now tap into when we have questions around supervision, around vivas. We also now have a network of potential external examiners that we can tap into. So sharing all of that knowledge exchange has been incredibly useful in expanding our own networks and, and connections. One of the challenges I think that we face um, is how we address the idea of traditional academic research and creative practice coexisting in a productive way. I have found in the past, in, in the UK in particular, possibly because of the pressures connected to REF submission, that there's a kind of a suspicion and a divide between traditional academics and creative practitioners. And this can be quite damaging and quite divisive within departments. So addressing some of those suspicions and exploring ways that traditional academics can engage with aspects of creative practice. And also we have to acknowledge the, the, the sense that creative practice is deeply theoretical, it's deeply attached to theory, that they should not be separated, theory should be deeply embedded within the various forms that come from creative practice. So there are lots of misunderstandings and suspicions around that that I think that we can start to try to break down and address. The other thing I think would be really useful, and this taps into what Yvonne was saying about formulas, and whether or not an individual practitioner wants to adopt a traditional formula, I think looking at a range of them is always useful. So a growing repository of case studies would be incredibly useful from, from a subject specific area in particular. So in film, this might be case studies related to screenwriting or participatory documentary um, or historical fiction. So a student working in those areas could look at the various forms previous PhD case studies have taken but also in terms of opening up more innovative and radical approaches to interdisciplinary methodologies, it again would be useful in terms of inspiring new formulas for us to be able to continue to look at a growing body of case studies in some form. 
The other thing that would be really useful from a practical perspective would be sharing templates um, in terms of agreements with industry partners or stakeholders. So I find before in working with um, PhD projects and also knowledge transfer projects with broadcasters and archives, for example, sometimes at the end of the process, that's when we realize the type of agreements we should have had in place all along. But that can be quite a complex thing to, to navigate. So it would be useful again to, to hear what other institutions and other supervisors and PhD students are, are doing in terms of setting up those partnerships with, with industry and with stakeholders. Another final thing that would be really useful to have access to would be um, maybe a, a page or, or a, a, an area of the toolkit that Anesh is going to talk about that is dedicated to funding calls. Sometimes it's not always easy to discern what funders are practice friendly. So um, having some guidance on that, even in terms of small pots of money that might be available to creative practitioners would be really useful. So those are just some reflections on what's been um, useful building the connections in the network, especially, and maybe some of the, the challenges that we now face um, in terms of academic screen practice. So now I will pass over to Helen Thielen, Professor of Arts Practice at the Irish Royal Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick and Chair of IMBAS. Thank you so much, uh, Kira, and to all my colleagues this morning for, for sharing. I've, I've just enjoyed so much what everybody has had to say, but I have to be honest, my, my mind is really still back with, with the little birds on Jules' window and the early morning images that you evoked and images of hope of the river and of the birds and all of that, you know, within the context in which we all find ourselves of, of, of fear and of, and of the unknown. And, um, if, you, if you don't mind, I, I have all my, my, my little notes here, but, but you've inspired me to say something a little bit different, which is, um, and it is related to this seminar series. When I, when I started uh, IMBUS in, in 2017, it was in the context of wanting so many of the things that I have found through this seminar series. Uh, looking for community, you know, for people who were working in a similar area, desperate to share information and, and experience. And, you know, one of the great uh, supporters and indeed members of, of, of IMBIS was my, um, my late husband, Michal O'Sullivan. And if I, if I can talk about Michal now, it's because I feel in good company with my colleagues here from University College Cork, where he spent so much of his professional life, as well as in Limerick. And of, um, very soon after IMBIS started, um, and Michal passed away, I just was unable to continue with that and with so much work and, and took leave and only came back um, to work in the context of the pandemic. And one of the very first seminars that I attended on my return to work was one of the visioning seminars. And over the course of this summer and these few months, uh, to have that sense of community in this area, you know, what, what Yvonne was talking about of one of the things I love about arts practice is that we are passionate about not separating the threads. We are passionate about our right to do research that brings our artistic passions and our personal experiences and our academic interests together because we insist on the mutual intelligence of all of those ways of knowing and those ways of being. And just picking up on what everybody has said so far, that is a very hard path to walk in the context of institutional academia. And I think that what I have felt over the course of these seminars is something of a tipping point, something where I sense something has started, which many of us were involved in independently in our separate, in our separate lives and our separate institutions but something a collective has ignited. And I go back to, you know, when, when, we, when I was talking about IMBIS in an earlier seminar, the three goals of that, which were, you know, building community, sharing information and helping to lobby in terms of policy. My own sense of this seminar series is that it has very profoundly impacted on two of those, 
on the building of community and the sharing of information. And I know that the sharing of information is core to what, what this group um, hopes to do and what this project hopes to do. And in terms of looking to the future, I think one area where we can all help each other is this question about policy. You know, how we might take our individual experiences. I absolutely concur with, with Inish's point there where one of the core important values that this seminar series has, has highlighted is that there is no one way of doing things. And I think insisting on the, you know, the, the, the beautiful kaleidoscope of our difference is, is incredibly important. But to have this guided by a, a set of values or principles or policies is something I think that helps us not only to build the kind of momentary community that we have now, but a more sustainable community going forward. And I think that's something that all of us collectively might be able to, to contribute towards. So really, mo mostly what I want to say is a, is a profound thank you uh, to everybody and to look forward to this, to this work developing. And I'm just going to pass now to, to another colleague in Cork, uh, Dr. Trina Nihihon, who's with us this morning as, as head of the Department of Music to say a few words on her experience of this series. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you so much. And it's just beautiful to listen to uh, your own words on this and also um, just to, to echo um, the, the sentiment everybody has expressed about Jules. Beautiful, beautiful, um, expressive, um, descriptive words at the beginning of this session, which I think spoke in so many ways um, to the importance of the pensive creative moment, um, often challenging. Uh, the more mundane academic structures um, that, that, that we often experience. Um, and on a personal note, um, Professor Jules Gilson is somebody who uh, champions this, this power of the creative and uh, did so once again so beautifully this morning. Thank you, Jules, for that. And to, to all of my colleagues uh, from whom I'm, I continue to learn uh, an immense amount, uh, I must say. So in relation to... Um, what, what the seminar series has meant to me um, on a personal level during kind of an unprecedented period of difficulty. Um, the, I, I can't even express what the seminar actually meant to be able to connect with you all, to be able to connect with colleagues and to, to keep engaged with the really, really important ideas and um, the things that are most important to us, uh, both in our scholarly and creative lives, as it were. And the other thing that really struck me about it was, you know, as has been mentioned already, the, the beautiful multiplicity that there exists, the incred incredible generative character of artistic research. And we heard from, you know, a, a huge range of experts from across Europe and from within Ireland. And each of them brought, you know, their unique perspective and their experience from the university where they are operating in and the general region that they come from and so forth. Um, but there was this incredible um, compatibility as well across everything we heard. So it's very clear that artistic research, um, you know, there, there is a character to artistic research, which is an, an, a central value to it, which is really embracing um, diversity and multiplicity and um, that beautiful sense of potentiality that there exists for artistic research. And that was something I was really struck by. Um, on a personal level, because of the, my own area of research, I think that this is incredibly important in how we frame what artistic research is um, to expand perhaps even further uh, who we might consider as appropriate candidates for artistic research or the different sorts of projects that we, we might imagine because the community of artistic um, researchers are so open to newness and difference. And sometimes that newness will actually be oldness. Um, and this is particularly important for um, oral traditional arts um, and for that sense of, you know, that embodied knowledge of the body um, and the centrality of the vocal. Uh, just to refer back to Yvonne Bonenfant's suggestion that perhaps there could be a viva voce process and no accompanying text and that it would be based 
on that uh, that moment of Koruk Eonit or that kind of ind individual combat. And of course, it is actually the Viva Voce moment is interesting in other reasons as well, because it does tie into um, very strongly into um, performance studies and um, theories of ritual, of course, because the Viva Voce is the quintessential dangerous passage uh, through which the, you know, the novitiate proceeds and then comes out the other side. So there's all kinds of um, interesting cultural reasons why the Viva Voce persists um, as well. Uh, but it really strikes me that there is just something so incredibly valuable um, that artistic research offers that cannot be replicated in other domains within the arts and humanities. And having come to the end of this series, I feel really energized despite the widespread exhaustion because of workloads at the moment within a COVID-19 situation, I genuinely feel, feel energized and renewed about the sheer importance of those particular knowledges um, that are actually rooted in creative practice itself, that are actually the, the sort of knowledges that really can only be learnt or got or understood from engaging in the practice itself. Um, and I think that that is profound. Um, and I think that for, um, you know, it was discussed um, at numerous times during the, the various seminars about the relationship of the written text to practice and the relationship of theory to practice. But what really struck me was um, how practice is so generative of theory. So I would look at it rather than, you know, that the practice must be theoretically engaged, that actually theory should be emanating from the experiential knowledges of the practice itself is something that really struck me about this process. And I think that that moment of actually allowing for that, that generation of new knowledges and new ways of thinking and understanding will also be at the core of how we expand this field to include um, you know, diverse subjectivities. Uh, so in my own field, this might be somebody who's, um, who has an incredible mastery of, of an oral traditional practice, for example. And the, um, you know, the, there, there is no abstract theory of that practice. Uh, there is no notational system of that practice, for example, that we would be maybe more used to within a traditional music PhD, for example. However, there are, there is, and there exists an extremely sophisticated and intricate system of musical and embodied thought and that exists in the practice itself. So I just see that there is this really important space um, from which uh, new understandings and new knowledges, uh, not just about creative practice, but about the world. Because of course, um, specialists in the area of performance studies, um, you know, for example, if we take, you know, Victor Turner, um, whose very famous work on liminality and drawing from the work of uh, Arnold van Genep. What's interesting about Victor Turner, just to take an example of a practitioner uh, who had a huge influence theoretically on, on the wider field of humanities, it was his own experience of liminality that was, um, you know, when he was moving away from Scotland, um, that actually was informing his, his um, his reading, it was his own experience of the practice of theatre that was actually feeding into uh, his theoretical knowledge. I know that that, you know, he's such an iconic figure, um, but at the core of that was um, a profound understanding rooted in the experiential. And to me, it just really strikes me that artistic research is so incredibly important, not just for us, for everybody else across the field of humanities. The contribution it makes is epic in every sense, uh, because epics can be sung. Um, but it, it, it is, I, I really think that, um, you, know, you know, Helen mentioned there how there just, this seems to be a, a period of reckoning, uh, the experience um, of, you know, visioning the future and what this has entailed of bringing people together and it's, it's very clear that there, there, is, there is now this really important network there, which can support bringing artistic research to a new level of prestige, as it were, even though 
I'm not saying prestige is the only thing that matters, but it is important to have the recognition within the wider humanities. Um, and also, I just wanted to say that um, Yvonne Bonenfant's uh, suggestion about, you know, advocacy and possibly a national doctoral school, I think that that's something that possibly would be, you know, that, that looks like a really interesting proposal and something really worth considering. Um, because it might happen, for example, that some institutions maybe might have one supervisor who would be suitable for a, pro a project in artistic research. And so it, it might make all the difference for there to be a national network of supervisors. Um, for example, that could actually, you know, create even more possibilities for students and that we then as supervisors and as practitioners and researchers in this area continue to learn from each other and from that support. Um, the other thing I was just really struck by was um, just the sheer humanity um, of every speaker and everybody who was involved. And it just seems to be such, um, there's such warmth to the group of researchers that were brought together for this. And that's also uh, a very important uh, aspect that we have to contribute to academia and how doctoral programs are developed and fostered um, with humanity uh, at its core and the, the lived experience of that. I've spoken for way too long, so I'm going to be quiet now, but uh, there we have it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Triana. And thank you colleagues, Kira, Helen and Yvonne. Um, it's difficult to summarize um, what was a gorgeous cor a cornucopia of, uh, of thoughts and ideas. So. I'm just going to uh, let them settle. Um, uh, attendees, if you have questions or thoughts for any of our panelists, please do put them in the question and answer um, uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to pass over to Inesh, um, who is going to um, introduce a draft version of our um, open educational resources. Um, that we will be developing as part of this uh, research project. And before I um, had really uh, got involved in this research project and had um, explored something about the pedagogy of, of artistic doctorates when I was in Helsinki last summer, back when we traveled, um, I, had, um, uh, uh, I was really curious about what an open educational resource was. Um, and I've since discovered and now I'm involved very much in, um, in making one and Inesh is leading on that. Um, so these are resources that are what they say on the tin. They are open, but they are also available um, for people to use. They're available for people to adapt. Um, so what we want to make sure is that we develop um, these resources in ways that very much meet the sensibilities and ambitions and um, explorations of this seminar series, um, as well as the interviews that Inesh is, is currently involved in. Um, and I'm going to pass over now to Inesh to introduce um, a, a kind of a, a, a draft that she's developed for us to reflect on. Thank you, Inesh. Thank you, Jill. So I'm just going to briefly introduce um, the resource. I will post a link on the chat right now, which you can click and uh, see um, as we discuss. And Michael, if you would like to share your screen, if you're unable to visit that uh, on your browser, you can, uh, Michael will be screen sharing shortly. Um, so this is what we're thinking at the moment is building an online platform, which will be a kind of a constellation map with several interlinked concepts, bubbles of themes or topics that we've been addressing so far. Um, and to think of those as a journey. So you'll see on the left hand side, prospective candidate might be thinking then about getting getting the funding together, thinking about what exactly is artistic research and why would I do a PhD or why would I engage with artistic research? And then the PhD candidate might also be thinking about those themes, but there might be other uh, areas of concern, how to share the practice, building communities, what skills they need, dealing with examination and so on. And then towards the end of the journey as a PhD graduate, then what kinds of um, information or um, themes you might be um, wanting to find out more about. 
So for example, uh, this is just a general draft of how it might be constructed. So if we click on, Michael, if you click on the supervision one, for example, you'll be taken to, so you would be able to click in any of these bubbles and you'll be taken to a, a, bo a, a board map with information, resources, might have some quotes from, uh, collected from the seminars, short video excerpts. So the idea is to, on the one hand, map out the wealth of knowledge that we've compiled, but also offer, and Michael, if you scroll down, we can see uh, proposals for action or suggestion of what we might do or explore differently or might make sense. Uh, in terms of supervision for this specific context. So some suggestions and ideas that then students and staff might be able to take forward. So um, if we go back to the main page, the, tool the toolkit draft, for example, um, and if you go towards the right hand side, you will see what I would like to do now and what I would like is to open up this Padlet to hear what your thoughts are. So you might have a look at the team and there is a little button on each of the teams which looks like a comment. Uh, I don't know if Michael, if you can point it out. Yeah. So if you have some ideas of other themes that you want to explore, you can add a comment there. If you have any feedback, you can also click on the feedback and add a comment or any ideas for the future. So um, kind of on the one hand, if you've got any suggestions, we will be quite happy to collect them here. And while you have a look at that, I'm going to go back to the panel and ask the panel what suggestion uh, you may have for um, um, as we develop this um, pack or resource. Kira. Thanks, Ines. Just something that occurred to me was, um, I mean, this is fantastic because so often the information that we share is through word of mouth and it can be serendipitous what information we actually get access to in, in relation to, to our PhD students. So one of the things I think that might be useful, especially when it comes to practice, is information on potential awards that are out there. And um, when, when I say awards, I don't necessarily mean funding. I mean awards that um, endorse and assess the actual practice itself. So as an example of this, I, I recently found out that the Learning on Screen Awards, which are UK based, will take um, submissions from Irish students and Irish institutions um, and it was only through asking them really <laughs> would they take them that, that they agreed it wasn't something that they'd done before so there may be other international awards across Europe across the world that might actually be relevant to us that we don't necessarily know about and, and it's maybe a good way for students to get external endorsement of their work um, because even if they're nominated for some of these awards it opens up the practice to new audiences that, that might not normally be accessible. So that was just something that would be certainly useful from a film perspective when students are, but also for students um, putting together video essays, which happens of course interdisciplinarily now in, in so many subject areas, that, that, that would be quite useful. Thank you, Chiara. Um, any other thoughts from the other panelists on how we might take this forward or develop it? If I might say something um, in the, I mean, this is a, a very complex thing to do and it'll be an excellent resource. Um, so congratulations on, on this conceptualization. Uh, I think um, why an artistic research PhD is a really interesting place to start and a really difficult place to start too. For, cause there are so many different reasons and articulating those in plural voices, I think is really important. But I wonder too, with this resource, um, if someone is considering why they're considering applying and a really big hurdle for a lot of um, uh, artist thinkers when they come to the PhD process is actually the traditional application form. Uh, having to develop um, an application in the form of the traditional research proposal when someone's been either done maybe a practice-based master's program or, um, or has been out of uh, 
academic environments for a really long time is really, really challenging. So it might be interesting to actually look at the different application forms in Ireland and processes and look at a resource base for helping people understand how they convert their drives into the language of an application form. Uh, Jules? Hi, thanks Inesh. Um, just picking up on what Yvonne was saying there, um, one of the things that has come up as part of the seminar, um, but which um, we haven't really focused on kind of fully or, or fully or comprehensively, but is that difference and it's not always a clear difference so sometimes it might be a gray area but it is as Yvonne suggests there it is very different if somebody has been a professional artist for say 20 years and then they come to be doing and wanting to apply for and do a PhD as opposed to somebody who maybe is much earlier in the beginning of their um, artistic career perhaps you know just a few years out of college and there's um, there's it's not that there, um, there's a difference in value at all. It's more that it's a really profound, different, different, profoundly different approach. So I, I really um, kind of um, support what Yvonne was saying there. Um, but also the alternative is also important that if you haven't been involved uh, perhaps professionally in artistic practice, what does that mean in terms of how you might engage with all of these uh, resources? So I just wanted to, to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. And Helen, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. How am I doing? Good. We can Great. hear you. Thanks. Thanks, Inish. Two, two quick observations. One of the things that has impressed me across this whole seminar series is how the actual the technology itself has been creatively put to the use of the research project. So the really innovative ways in which you're using recording and Padlet and excerpting information and putting that together in creative clusters. So I'm, I was one of the things that occurred to me as you were showing us that is it seems that a need that has come across in a number of the seminars, particularly the ones with PhD students, is some kind of work in progress community. I think this is one thing that that creative artists and particularly doctoral students need is is some way of checking in with other people doing similar work as the work progresses. And it occurred to me that, that using that online space in a particular way where people could share their work in progress, but also get feedback from other people can then become part of the research project. So something about the, the open educational resource that you're creating also being in service to the research agenda could be really interesting. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Trina, you'd like to add something, please? Yeah, this is something I suppose that's more general, but in relation to resources for students, um, it might, and this actually might be useful for various institutions as well, is to, uh, to have a list of uh, supervisors at various institutions um, or, you know, key experts that might be suitable as, um, external examiners actually for for um, Viva Voce's or um, you know if if a student is interested in doing um, work across two institutions it might be a way that they kind of can see people who they might feel that where their artistic practices at the moment might resonate with those it's a very simple um, suggestion really but might be something that would be practically very useful um, for students and also for supervisory teams. Um, I think the sense of network that this project has already generated is going to be really important because, um, you know, many people are, you know, many supervisors won't have done um, artistic doctorates themselves, for example. And so that network and learning from and, uh, you know, continuing to, to learn about that process as it changes and as a student develops and as the challenges come on will be uh, really important. Um, there might even be capacity for uh, a mentorship um, program for, for new supervisors in the field as well, because there might be many people who feel this is something I really, really would love to be involved in, but they might lack confidence because of the, the newness of it 
to their institutions particularly um, because I suppose having um, you know having a, a good sense of weight behind it as a concept and what the process is likely to look like because you know it was brought up numerous times how um, artistic research eludes um, these kind of strict bureaucratic categorizations and that's you know part of its worth and at the same time uh, for somebody who is hoping to create a space for artistic research at their institution, those are precisely the questions that they are going to have to grapple with with their own institution and to be able to, I suppose, to, to, to translate um, the, the values and processes of an artistic doctorate into, you know, what will work within that particular institution as well. Thank you. We've got a question from the audience. Um, if the plan is to share the platform and collaborate with the um, IUA, the Irish University Authority. Um, I pass that, that one on to you, Joe, in terms of how, I, don't, I think we haven't thought that further yet, but maybe you'd like to add some thoughts. Yes, that isn't something that we've um, discussed, but that's certainly a potential. I mean, I suppose the spirit of the project is very much that it is open and that we, uh, the, the organisations that we've been interested in collaborating with um, in the short remit of this project have been the Irish Research Council and the Arts Council, um, but we haven't engaged directly with the Irish Universities Association, um, or maybe it's authority, um, and, uh, but we'd be very open to that. Thank you, Jules. Um, we also have a comment, uh, let me just uh, read the one of the biggest issues, certainly across the UK, is the lack of common ground among institutions and supervisors. And I think we did talk a little bit about the variety and plurality of approaches here. And sometimes these, these uh, supervisors have not done artistic research PhDs themselves. So Prague UK is attempting to do some of this community building in the UK, but not a resource like this which is surely needed. So I think this goes back to, um, to the necessity and the need for a resource like this at this time. And we've got another question. Yeah, Jules? We can go to the question, that's okay. I'll come back. Um, how, do we, how do we manage upwards if we're doing a PhD in creative practice and our supervisor is not as experienced with the research, how do we gently bring them into the project? To this project? Um, to the PhD project. I think that question goes back to uh, challenges in terms of supervision uh, and in terms of what we've already mentioned, the uh, relationship between arts practice and more traditional practices and bringing that together. So how do we gently bring a supervisor who is not experienced with research, artistic research, into the PhD project? Trina. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. I suppose it comes back to the, um, you know, this is obviously a case of Dunan Dirichet and Nafal, and now what I'm going to suggest, but, um, if um, this is why, um, you know, when you, when you choose the supervisory team, it's, it's so important. Um, and just I'm thinking back to Paulo de Assis and the way he was talking about how the structure that you actually bring um, to a project is a key part of the story that your, your PhD research will tell. So I suppose that that might be one practical uh, way is to engage in discussions about, you know, the, the structure side of things first and to say, you know, I'm hoping to have this output and this is why. Um, but it also reminds me of um, comments that were made throughout the, the series as well about how um, the supervision process for artistic research um, perhaps should move away from um, the more established Socratic methods that we would be used to, I suppose. Um, and that the supervisor would take on a role of actually trying to experience the artistic practice, um, not just um, falling back on, you know, visiting the, um, we can't visit each other now at the moment, of course, but, you know, getting feedback during office hours on written work. So trying to um, find a way of just creating space for dialogue with the actual practice itself would strike me as something that might be important there. Um, and looking into um, other supervisory 
um, practices, maybe um, it's about how to, if we, what I take from the question is that the supervisor in question, that this might be very new to them, so that they might be leaning on the, co the more traditional paradigm still. Um, and it's, 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 it is so new to, new to people, um, you know, my, myself included, of course, I'd be one of the people for whom it would be most new. Um, so, but that would, if I were the supervisor, that's just something that I think might be helpful for me, for example, is to just be thinking, okay, how, how is this supervision going to be different? And how does it need to be different? Thank you. I'll pass over to Helen now. A very quick comment just to pick up on what Trina was saying there. You know, as we as this conversation progresses, I think it becomes clearer to all of us what what a what a what a seismic paradigm shift this is. You know, it, it can seem sometimes like we're talking about very small or particular things like a policy document or a viva voce, but what we're actually talking about is a whole shift in how we understand knowledge and primarily that within institutional learning. And I think one of the most significant ways that we can contribute to that, and I think this has come across in all the presentations today, is reimagining the institution. And there's nobody better positioned to do this than artists because so many of us are outside of those walls, or so many of us walk between those spaces all the time. So, you know, break, breaking down any simplistic notion we have about the, the structures and literally the building blocks of education, I think will have a root and branch effect on all of the things that we've been talking about in this seminar. Thank you, Helen. So at this point, I'm just, I'll, I have just typed in the Padlet uh, link again. So if you'd like to come back to it later on the day and add any comments and reflect, we'll be collecting those. And I think it's time to close up. So I'll pass on to Jules. Thank you. Thank you, Inesh. Um, thank, thank you, everybody on the panel today. And thank you, Michael, behind the scenes. And Helen, thank you for that um, description of the seismic shift that we all need to um, pay close attention to in terms of allowing artistic research to resonate and filter through the academy. And I think that's a wonderful place to stop, um, especially because um, IMBAS, in a sense, once this research project has completed, IMBAS is the, the, the place where this research hopefully will continue to, to grow and develop and um, will uh, give support to Irish scholars and artists engaged in this kind of work for many years to come. So without further ado, I say goodbye and thank you so much everybody for everything you've contributed to this seminar program. Thank you. Bye-bye.